Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mindful Metal Jacket. I am Joe List, and I am being blasted by the sun through my window, and it's shining off my forehead and looks ridiculous. My glasses, too. But if you're listening to just audio, well, you are fortunate because I got a real goofy face here. But what I do is I meditate and I let go, and I can even stop identifying with my face. Hmm? Those are some of the gifts of meditation. Welcome to the show. Uh, I appreciate you guys bearing with me through this uh, temporary period of hiatus, but I'll have you know that I've started recording episodes again. I recorded one with Sam Marill, which will be out soon, which was one of my favorite episodes. And uh, my pal, Matt Wayne, who's hilarious, will be on the show soon. But um, right now we're working on these compilations. In the meantime, while I get my schedule in order, and this episode, I'm really excited about, and I'm grateful for the producers of the show that put together this little compilation called The Joy of Meditation. And it's got some highlights from some of our best episodes featuring some of our best meditators and meditation teachers, including the great Sharon Salzberg, who is uh, something of a legend in Dharma circles. She's one of the sort of people uh, really responsible for bringing Eastern philosophy and meditation to the West. And she was quite a get. And uh, she's on here. She's a legend. You can look her up or ask anybody that knows anything about meditation. And uh, they know who Sharon Salzberg is. So she's in here as well as Kevin Griffin, who's fantastic, who's another um, meditation teacher. Also Shafi Hossein is one of my good buddies. He talks a lot about it as well. And, um, and then Corey Allen, who's a friend of mine, who's great and also a meditation teacher and um, he's got his own podcast called Astral Hustle which is great I recommend everybody check that out so it's a little compilation of all of them all talking about meditation and um, I love meditation it's the best tool in my toolbox and it's changed my life I do it every day multiple times a day throughout the day and I think there's a lot to be learned in these um, these little clips and a lot of great books out there um, I recommend anything by Thich Nhat Hanh, Sharon Salzberg, Tara Brock, who I just met yesterday, who I hope to have on the show someday. We'll see. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, Jack Kornfield, uh, Corey Allen, who's on the show, has a book. Sharon has a book. Pema Chodron. A lot of great, great meditation uh, teachers. And of course, um, the Sam Harris's app, the Waking Up app, is one that I've fallen in love with. And I love the Calm app is another great app with um, Tamara Levitt that I use a lot. So a lot of great places. YouTube has a lot of great stuff too. And, um, and here you're going to hear a lot more about it. Um, I appreciate you listening to the podcast and um, welcome to all of the new folks that may have joined, heard about it uh, on the Joe Rogan experience. We appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe, subscribe to the show, leave a nice review and subscribe to my YouTube. If you would leave a comment, thumbs up, all those algorithm things. Really grateful. And like I said, there'll be new full interviews coming soon. I um, already got one in the can. It'll be out uh, in the next week or so. So I appreciate it. I hope that you're doing well. And I hope you take some moments to meditate. And um, here's a little quote from the aforementioned John Cabot Zim, who I can't, it's hard to read because I took my glasses off because they were reflecting in the sun. <laughs> Anyways, John Kabat-Zinn said, It is indeed a radical act of love just to sit down and be quiet for a time by yourself. Maybe before you listen, pause and just enjoy some silence by yourself and then enjoy these conversations. Thanks again for listening. I love you. I don't, I haven't listened to the podcast that much, but I know your book and I've, I talked to you recently on your podcast and it seems yeah. extremely philosophical and, um, there's a lot of, I mean, the book is about mindfulness. So is the podcast co not comical now? I mean, well, <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. It is, it's, it's, a, it is comical to a degree. Like I joke around pretty constantly, probably more than the guests would like, but, uh, it is, it's about, you know the inner life but in a deep way but like that shit if you don't if you're not laughing while you're talking and thinking about you know the inner path i think that you're missing a huge part of the point of it all right 
I think that like the just the comedy and the absurdity of existence at, as it is is so overwhelmingly connected to all of the meaning and purpose of existence and to me pursuing those two things simultaneously not only is fun but it, it actually inoculates one or the other against uh the indulgence of the self right so if you get too serious you, then you start you know you turn into an asshole and you start just talking platitudes and shit like that and then you lose your sense of humor you become too hard it's kind of like the alan watts thing you know you want to be prickles and goo not too gooey not too prickly prickles and goo so the show is prickles and goo that's a great name for a podcast. Yeah, ah, especially shit. especially if you had a partner, one of you could be yeah. prickles and one of you could be goo. But that reminds me uh, of a thing I remember reading. I forget in which book, but it was saying if you laugh hard enough, you'll start to cry, and if you cry hard enough, you'll start to laugh. Mm -hmm. So those two um, things are both sort of uh, natural and um, what's that word? See, this is where I get intimidated by your intelligence. Um, what <laughs> Remember, do you, it's relative, man. What do you call it? Uh, involuntary. There's sort of involuntary uh, things that are very close to each other. And yeah. I'm, I'm sure you're somebody that thinks about, talks about, is is aware that good and bad are are two sides of the same coin. Happy, sad, whatever, positive, negative. You can't have one without the other. Is that, am I correct in thinking that or am I You're way correct. Off on that? You nailed it. <laughs> and not only is it that, but let me just put a little pepper on that because I've thought about this a great deal. Like, so, the, and this may, uh, hopefully this isn't too far into the, the thing you were just talking about, but I spent like, I had an interesting insight about four years ago, whenever I was um, just going around, going along, prodding at my brain as usual. And I began to realize, like, I had some sort of extreme experiences. And then I began to realize that I was, uh, because of the you know inheritance of my uh, baggage, essentially, you know, my, all of my, uh, preconditioned behavior and ways of thinking, given my family environment and so forth, I kind of grew up like forcing myself to see the positive in everyone. Right. And it's this time I had this realization that that was happening. And if you read about, you're probably, are you familiar with attachment theory? Like John Bowlby's theory of attachment, just being in therapy, you might um, I don't know specifically that guy's theory. I mean, I'm, I'm aware of, uh, I've read a bunch of Buddhist stuff and the idea of attaching to mm. thoughts and the attachment, non, I, under, I, I understand some amount of non-attachment of not attaching to your thoughts and your feelings and that you aren't, you are not your thoughts. I mean, is that anything that's a thing, but Similar? it's not what I was talking about. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Definitely a thing. It's, um, but you could see how I would think that was attachment theory. 100%, yes. And there's actually someone, uh, a guy, George Haas, that blends the two. But uh, Bowlby is like a Western psychiatrist that developed the theory of attachment, which basically when you're born, you have either like a, a destructive, constructive, and secure, insecure attachment with your parents. So the idea is, and this could just be from our discussion of the day, I thought this might actually be something that you would find interesting and useful to think about. But uh, whenever you are born into your family, we naturally you know, want a secure attachment to our parents. They're supposed to be a place of unconditional love. And so when we go out into the world to individuate and to you know become ourselves, the world is not necessarily trustable but it's testable but knowing that we always have this secure attachment and unconditional love with our parents it allows us to go out and explore the world confidently always knowing that we can return to safety if you are not shown that love and you're not you know uh, groomed with the appropriate appropriate secure attachments as a child you feel disconnected from your family so you don't have that conditional love from your parents but then what happens whenever you grow out begin to try and individuate yourself and go into the world you then don't have a trustable base to go back to so when you're trying to explore the world you become trapped in between two polarities of an unsecure home you know base and then the world also seems unsecure so what usually starts happening is you become this weird like singularity chameleon thing where uh others around you start auto-regulating your emotional states 
because you're just trying to find both of those, like the appeal of and comfort of unconditional love and the trust and the exploration all at once. And it doesn't really work that way. So you end up being like, well, if I'm in a room with someone who is happy, then I'm happy. If I'm in a room with someone who's angry, then I'm angry. And I'm going to talk to them about their anger and try and help them to build that security. You know, so it's a, I, after I got into that and started reading about it, and by the way, this, the guy George Haas is a, a mindfulness teacher that uses mindfulness meditation and attachment theory to help kind of quiet the mind and then allow that negative space to therefore, like when the, the rising thoughts and the realizations of those attachments come, then you can kind of process them using mindfulness. Anyway, um, so whenever I kind of like got in, got into reading about this and thinking about it myself, I, I discovered that like that was definitely what's happening. So I started trying to approach people with a bit more objectivity and not allowing them to co-regulate my emotions of pausing and be like, okay, what am I thinking and feeling right now? And like, what, what do I need right now? And how much of myself should I give to this interaction? How much should I allow myself to become emotionally involved uh, in another person's current experience. And in that kind of exploration, I realized that I was very much always giving everyone the benefit of the doubt in trying to see the best part of everyone because I came from a very um, negative background. And so I sort of had to see the positive side to have some sense of hope, you know. And so whenever I stopped doing that, and I pulled back a little bit, I saw that um I really started seeing the negative as well of people, right? So where if you're always like kind of looking for the positive and you take a step back, then we'll wait, hold on, there's this other thing. And then that becomes really challenging because now once you've seen, you start seeing the negative people of people, that becomes very loud because you're unused to seeing it with such relief, right? And so it was like a, a good six months to a year of me just like really struggling with not getting irritated or even judgmental about, you know, seeing kind of the dark side of every, we all have it, you know, seeing that dark side. And I realized as I thought about it further, like that we shouldn't coddle the light side or judge the dark side because really, and to the beginning, you know, to your notion about the two sides of the same coin, there is the dark and the light, there's the heads and the tails, but there's actually a third part of it, which is the observer. So that's you, right? So the observer of the dark, the observer of the light, and the observer of the coin that's either ending up on heads or tails is the part where you come in. So it's actually a trinity, right? So even two sides have a third side, which is your perception of those sides. And you can move past the judgment of the, of the dark and the coddling of the light by simply speaking through those things, not getting invested in them and speaking to the center and the heart of the individual outside of judgment or outside of creating security for yourself. I mean, see, this is where I get <laughs> intimidated talking to you because you say so much that I'm like, oh, I, that reminds me of this. Oh, I, I should say this. I thought of this. And I'm now my, my circuits have all broken. <laughs> you topsy turvy? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I've lost all, all bearings on where I am. I, I, my, my compass is gone and the, you know, the sun is behind a cloud and I don't know where I am. Um, but um, that's an interesting thing that remind, made me think of something else I've heard before and read and all. And now I've just read so much stoicism and buddhism and mindfulness that i don't know what's where i read whatever but sure it that made me think of the the theory that reality is neutral and everything is just perceived through us and can be looked at one way or the other is that something that you think about or believe in is that true I, that has been my major obsession for like 20 years is that the world is not an inherent evil in oh. the world or an inherent good in the world it's all perception well that that gets well there is there's the okay this that's a big okay that's a big question so there's <laughs> what one puts forward is there's the moral landscape of the natural world which can kind of objectively have suffering and victims and uh you know quote unquote heroes and so forth how one perceives and and quantifies that natural moral landscape is what you're taught what you're kind of getting at and yes that is completely subjective you know so we're just i i've talked about this 
just sort of it's such an abstract idea i think for someone who hasn't thought of it before but i've put it in a way that like imagine the world outside of your skin right so mm -hmm. everything that exists outside of your skin is the objective world right. you are the subject because you're the one that's looking at the world outside of your skin and so your nervous system which contains all of your senses is like an instrument in a laboratory taking a reading of the world outside of your skin at all the time at all times so you're getting all the data and information about you know what's in the room around you you know all that type of stuff but then based upon your as I said earlier, your genetics, your inherited family structure, the culture, your set of unique chance experiences, all of those things form you know, neural imprintations, which begin to slowly shape your worldview of the world. So as you perceive the world through your senses, it is filtered through your subjective, my, one of my mentors calls it reality tunnels. So it basically you have your flavor and your angle or your, you know, framework of how you're perceiving everything. And right. Really, we're, we're really quickly approaching the key of Buddhist enlightenment. I'll, I'll stop there and we'll <laughs> go on. Well, so um, I've also heard or read recently that there's a clever fun stay, saying if it's hysterical it's historical that um <laughs> everything you react to the way you react to everything is learned in the first six or seven years the formative years as they would say so right. like when i am in line at the bagel place and the guy in front of me is ordering nine bagel and it's taking longer than i wanted and i'm like what the f fuck this guy <laughs> there's a theory that that is all drawn back to something that happened to me when I was four or five or six. That's where I learned whether my parents reacted that they were impatient or they were anxious or they, their perception of time and we're running out of time and we have to get things done. Right. Is there any, do you, do you feel any connection to that theory or thought? Oh yeah. I mean, it's like everything basically, um, there's, if, if this couldn't get more nerdy here, here we go. So <laughs> there's this guy, Alfred Krasinski, who's the, he's the guy that wrote the book of general semantics and, and, uh, 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 non-Aristotelian theory, like in the 1930s, I used to be a big fan of his when I was in my twenties. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, he has an interesting thing because he really got into, you know, this type of stuff in a, in a deep way. Like he did this experiment where he just didn't talk for a year just to try and understand what, like how language shaped the way that we think and it shaped, you know, the way that we see the world. Um, anyway, so he has a thing in, in his book, Science and Sanity, that no one listening to this should buy because it's like a 900 page tomb that's very impenetrable. Yeah. Um, I, these, these people all came from Tuesdays with Stories and You Know What Dude podcast. Oh, so we, we, oh, might have to start, yeah, we might have to start <laughs> dumbing this down just a little. No, with respect to uh, the fans and myself. I mean, so yeah no no anyways basically okay so <laughs> there's a thing in there called the structural differential which there's gonna there's gonna be one dude listen to this that's like oh my god i i know this but anyway <laughs> the structural differential is like uh this this model that he created short of it is is that every initial interaction you have with like a one-to-one -one singular experience is like creates the the biggest impact of how you'll see and relate to that thing moving forward. And then each future experience, the impacts become smaller and smaller. So like if you get stabbed, if your first experience in like elementary school with a pencil is someone stabs you in the thigh with a pencil, like that's pencil one. And then from then on, even if you have plenty of great positive experiences with pencils, there's still going to be this like weird biological subconscious resistance and a discomfort around pencils because of that initial experience. But like our everything, all of the contents of our entire life and our minds operate by the same principles. Yes. Yeah, see, that is fascinating to me. And one of the scary things about having a child is that mm -hmm. no matter how hard you try and how good of a job you do they're still going to be fucked up yeah. uh in some ways but that is also the nature of life and that could even get into stoicism which i have a hard time saying that is that <laughs> horrible 
things are going to happen and that's just reality and it's unavoidable. I mean, yeah. I, that's another thing I've been reading a bunch about and, and sort of studying lately uh, is the idea that there's, I mean, which is kind of obvious, but it's obvious on the surface as a statement that you can't avoid negative things, bad things, but somehow, even though it sounds obvious, people um, maybe consciously or subconsciously think that you are able to, which is where so much I feel like anxiety and stress comes from is people trying to control and never have an unpleasant experience of, yeah. you know, flossing so they don't have to deal with the dentist and eating healthy so they don't have a heart problem and wearing a seatbelt so they get in a car accident, which are all positive things. But ultimately, you cannot avoid some sort of crisis, tragedy, negative thing in life. Yeah. So which is where acceptance comes in, which to me, I talk about a lot on this show, Everything I study from sobriety, uh, you know, recovery and mindfulness and Buddhism and stoicism and therapy, the one common thread throughout all of those is acceptance. Yeah. Now, do you feel like... You don't seem like you're someone particularly anxious. Maybe that's because you're young, but your your father has it, and mm. uh, so does it not. Wor- is it something that you you're like I can't control this, so I can't worry about it too much, or do you just feel like you're you're young and youthful, and you don't you don't care about other people? Right, like I, the idea of anxiety and depression is such a you know coming from Bangladesh it's very different I guess right so it's like a journey completely on its own for me of like how I kind of um understood depression how I kind of uh, got introduced to anxiety how I kind of found myself right it's like it's a lot of different things that can add to your anxiety and depression I feel like it's not by its own um so when I was when I was like 10 I think I mentioned this that my mom My mother, my sweet, sweet mom, she introduced me to this quantum foundation in Bangladesh, which is the biggest foundation for meditation. Um, And meditation is not something that people really talk about in Bangladesh before this. Before this, meditation was not something that people did. And so the, the reason my mom introduced quantum foundation to me is because they had like a student program which was all about like mantra meditation you would you would give you give yourself like positive affirmations that oh you're gonna study today or you go to your they they do this uh, place it's called like a dream house where you go to your dream house and then you have a command center where you go to that command center and command yourself how you're gonna spend the day Right, like how you're gonna you're gonna spend two hours of studying, two hours of working out, two hours of playing the whatever you want. You tell your brain, and because like there's enough scientific evidence that shows when you're meditating, your brain goes to that theta state where it's more prone to taking suggestions from yourself because like you're just like thinking about it differently, not like just being autopiloting throughout the day. So my mom's like motivation was that I'll be a better student through that. So that's why she made me do it. And that was like the best thing I have ever done. Like I was so blessed to like find this thing that my parents don't really like everyone in my family kind of went through this meditation track, like the boot camp that I went through, but they don't really practice it as much as I do now. Um, so I've been very lucky with the expo- ex- like being exposed to meditation at an early age. Um, but then like, you know, like the idea of depression is not really like talked about in Bangladesh and South Asian communities. And I'm sure you know about this kind of, it's not like really, uh, prevalent to talk about. It's just like something like Bigfoot. Like, what is that about? We don't really, you know what I mean? We don't really understand it. So we don't really talk about it. And why Um, is that? Is it like, like the way in Ireland, they don't talk about things or is it taboo or is it just, I guess, I guess when you have people dying from poverty p- people don't get to talk about depression yet you know what i mean they're like bigger problems i guess and that's why it's like it's like cornered which is not good because that could lead to like so many other problems that people don't really understand it's like it's a manifestation of other things that people don't realize i guess and that's why it's not given like like we one common thing about every part of the world is that we care more about dental hygiene than about mental hygiene right like we floss like brush every day floss every day Mm -hmm. but like no one talks about going to a therapist as often you know 
um right. which is which is insane because like because like you rather have yellow teeth than have to have have to cry at starbucks again or something like that like right. that would be right, crazy right. like why you do um like people have cavities but i'm sure what hurts more is the void in their soul you know what i mean like why would you not go to a therapist it's way more important um, yeah com- completely and to me that's like the dream like to be 10 years old and be introduced to meditation like i i think we should be introducing young young children in like preschool and kindergarten to meditation i think like all of the world's problems not all but so many of the world's problems would be solved if we started teaching med- meditation and mindfulness oh 100 percent. i completely agree with you um because like that was like so that was something that was always in the back in my head that, oh, meditation is this something that you can use to really harness your brain, right? But I never really truly appreciated it till I went to college, right? When I moved to the States and I, I, you know, I met people that were really depressed. So like, I feel like there are three types of sadness, right? There's the, there's the clinical sadness, which is like, you really need drugs to treat them. Right. And then mm-hmm. there's sad, sad, which is like toxic people just being sad. And there's good, sad. There's like no happiness. I think there's good, sad, meaning that you get sad, but you realize why you're sad and you try to affect change in your life. Right. Cause like I, people like with the amount of trauma and sadness we have in the world, it's it's obviously very reasonable to be upset about things, right? But like sure. the way you deal with it, I guess, is kind of what what is up to you, right? And that, and my introduction to stoicism, I guess, was one of the biggest um, things that kind of changed how I look at life, right? Like stoicism's idea of negative visualization and yes, um, goal setting of like what? Oh hell yeah, I love look that at this. book. I got a guide to the good life, the ancient art of stoic joy right next to me. Yeah, that's a, that's a book I sent to all of my, I have a PDF version of that book, which I will send to every single of my friend who wants to learn about stoicism. Like William Arvin, that guy just changed my life. It was just like one of the best books I've ever read. And yes. I, so good. You want to talk about how you came across it and how yeah, you well, feel about so the book? I feel like I interrupted you because I got so excited that you no, mentioned stoicism and I just happened to be holding this book uh, yeah. a moment before. That's, this is what I was reading right before we started recording. And um, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, I sent a copy to uh, Robert Kelly, who's got some mental problems, certainly. And um, <laughs> I, I, I sent a copy to him. He's also a past guest, and he was terrific on the podcast. But um, yeah, no, Stoicism. Now, when did you... I'll talk about when I discovered it, but when did you discover it, I want to hear? I discovered in college, and there was a reason behind that. I guess um, I was becoming more because I grew up kind of religious, right? And then I kind of was moving away from it. And there's this void, right? Like, like God is this huge deal, right? Pe- for people who are religious, this huge deal. And once you're like moving away, you feel very scared because, like, the other book that kind of changed my life was the Denial of Death, which kind of plays hand in hand on how mm-hmm. I look at the world. Um, because that, that idea is pretty much how, like in the book, the author, Ernest Becker kind of posits the idea of how humanity is just a reaction to the idea that we are all, uh, mortals and we don't like to die. We don't want things to end. So we created these three things to solve the, solve that problem. Um, one of that being is like, oh, we're not actually dying. We're going to heaven. You know, that solves that problem right away. Um, so that, like having that in my head, I was like, okay, okay. So like that makes sense. Like how how can I cope with stuff like that? How can I be okay with death? And that was kind of my journey to finding more philosophy, like reading more about Stoicism and the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. And all of that kind of helped me understand myself and my, just make me more grounded. Um, right. Because like if you if you look at if you, if if when I started looking at my friends who are like you know engineers very smart people and doing great things in like you know their companies and whatever but they're never like happy they're always chasing the next thing 
and it's like they feel like and and comedians as well i have like so many friends and i'm sure you have seen that as well where they're always like looking for the next netflix special or the next big thing right like for example if you if you're an open micer you want to be on a show if you're on a show you want to be on a festival you have a festival you want to have a late night if you're on a late night you want a netflix you netflix you want a tv show they, the, the baseline of your happiness is always going to shift because you're never in the present so like when i when i when i see my friends going through that i i i made it my goal just to be okay with where i am but at the same time doing things i love every day to counteract the anxiety it's like i have a checklist of things that oh if i'm anxiety i know what things to do that will make me happy if that makes sense control of the arising of our thoughts and i think that is a very forgiving reality because usually we, we blame ourselves so mercilessly for what we're thinking what we're feeling it shouldn't be there it should be over it i've been in therapy you know i've meditated all these years when I, and realizing that we can't control what arises in our minds but we actually can relate very differently to what arises in our minds and so we can be kinder to ourselves we could remember it's not just me you know, this is kind of part of human conditioning or many people have this tendency, you know, give yourself a break. Right. Like if you blame yourself for an hour and a half, that is not going to leave you with a lot of energy to start over, you know, and right. it's going to leave you exhausted. And so it's just not that skillful a reaction. And so we kind of say, well, you know, I've been down that road before. Let me be kinder to myself. Things like that. We have lots of options in right. terms of how we relate. Yeah, my therapist always gives me the advice, and I'm sure you've heard it and read it before, and I read it places, is that advice to be as kind to yourself as you would be to somebody else, because I would never, you know, if my wife tried meditating, I wouldn't go, yeah, but I bet you were thinking a bunch of thoughts, you dummy, you know, I'm like, what's the point, you're still going to have anxiety, like it would be viciously mean, which we tend to be to ourselves, which I, I don't know what the science behind that is, but um, it's horrible. I feel that way all the time in my mm -hmm. career and everything, all, all these things of, so yeah, but you're still not making that amount of money. You didn't, that one person hated your act or whatever it is. And so, and I, I talk about this a lot on, on this podcast and I've read it a lot too. And maybe you could speak to it or that the idea of meditation is sort of deepens the grooves of uh, a lot. it works that muscle to kind of go back into that um quieting the mind and sort of recognizing that thoughts are just thoughts because if you're not doing that that's just your habit is to go back into maybe self-hatred or believing whatever thoughts you mm -hmm, have and sort mm -hmm. of so it's trying to kind of undo that is that one of the things of, of mindfulness yeah no definitely and it's it's sort of knowing the difference between what's actually arising thought feeling sensation whatever it is and what we're adding to it you know like a very common thing would be you feel physical pain or discomfort or you feel emotional pain you feel heartache you feel disappointment and right away you start thinking what's it going to feel like tonight what's it going to feel like tomorrow what's it going to feel like next week so not only are you having to deal with what's actually happening, which is that something hurts, you know, but you've now added all that anticipation on top of it and it feels overwhelming because it is overwhelming, you know? Right. And so that's a habit. It's just a habit to add the future, you know, right. when something doesn't feel good or, uh, you know, what we were kind of talking about before, I shouldn't feel this, you know, I've been in therapy all this time. Why am I still angry? Why is this still coming up? Or, or I've been meditating for 50 years, for God's sake, why is this still coming up? And, you know, it's just like if you think about the energy that we expend in judging ourselves, which only leaves us exhausted, you know, and demoralized, it doesn't leave us with like, I'm going to learn not to do that again, you know? Like, right. It, it's not like a tool of resilience by any means. And so, um, that's what we learn to undo. Not the th original thoughts, feelings, sensations, because that's just life, you know? Things arise because we are very conditioned in certain ways. And, and so, um, but we can be totally different with what arises. Right. And, and that's like 
it's very possible. It's not unreal or imaginary and it's freedom. Right. You know, like also listening to, you know, I think about my friend, one of my colleagues, Sylvia Borstein, who um, she's 81 or 82 now. And she describes herself as a recovering catastrophizer. And uh, that's what drove her to learn how to meditate is because she was suffering so much from, as she put it, she'll describe herself this way, like, I'll call one of my adult children, and, you know, they're all, like, in their 50s and 60s now. I'll call one of my children, and they don't answer the phone. So my first thought is, well, they must be dead. Right. So it never occurs to me they're taking a shower. Right. You know, or they just fell in love. They don't feel like talking to their mother. Right. And, you know, and that's what got her to meditate was to have to deal with my mind somehow because, of course, and it's not only our own anxiety, it affects relationships when you're like on your kids that way, you know, for example. And uh, she might have those thoughts, not with the same prevalence, maybe not with the same intensity, but they come and now she laughs at it because she also knows that she describes herself in a real situation where something's gone wrong, she's like a rock. She's steady. She's present. She's helpful. You know, she's not intrusive. It's just when she's left alone with her mind, you know, right. spinning out that she goes there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, that makes me feel good to hear because I have a very similar thing, a similar experience. And I've talked about this on the show before, is that I, in my mind, I'm this really weak terrified person and I'm not going to be able to handle anything. If anything goes wrong, it's all going to come apart. Um, but in reality, I think there's actually some psychological studies that really anxious um, neurotic people are actually the best in uh, crisis situations. Um, but I had, I always use it as an example. I'll go to, um, if I have blood taken or any kind of needle or get anesthetized at the dentist or uh, whatever it is, I'll go, I, I really don't like needles. I get, I get really freaked out. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? Like, what happens? And I'm like, I just get really nervous. And then they're like, well, do you pass out? Do you run out of the chair? And I was like, oh, no, nothing like that. And they're like, oh, that, to them, that's bad. People, some people you take blood and they, they pass out or they, they run away or they, they punch the doctor in the face. I'm like, oh, no, I'm just uncomfortable. That would be bad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... I had a tooth extraction and the dentist, there was stitches in there and he was taking the stitches out and I was like, I'm sweating. I can't, I can't, I don't know if I can do this. And then when he was doing it, I was completely still. And he's like, you just handled that better than 95% of patients. Uh, it's just my anxiety and he's not even noticing it really. So I feel similarly, and I, I've always been a hypochondriac too. So same thing. If I have knee pain, I'm going to need knee surgery. If I have a headache, I got you know, a brain tumor, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, now through meditation and therapy as well, it allows myself to be, to kind of go, it's probably not that. And it, it's much more short lived. It's still there. I still have those thoughts, but it's much more short lived, mm -hmm. um, which feels like progress. It's huge progress. And it's, the, it's real progress, you know, because I think we would all like the great breakthrough experience after which none of the stuff ever came up again, but uh, I think that's not what happens. I think that it still arises. We relate very differently to it. It doesn't last as long. We don't take it in as deeply. You know, the sort of like, I call it the Swiss cheese theory of transformation. It's like we poke holes in it even as it's there. Right. You know, so it's not like solid and inflexible. It's like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe not, you know. Right. I've heard uh, the analogy about... Um you know, zebras looking for zebras or something in the medical field where if you're in New York City, uh, I live in New York and I think you did as well or do. And if you hear like a clip clop in the street, most likely it's a horse. There's horses in New York, but like hypochondria anxiety is like, that's probably a zebra. I bet that's a zebra. And you're like, well, there could be a zebra walking up seventh Avenue, but most likely it's a horse. And so I feel that way with, I always use that analogy of, when I'm feeling sick or whatever it is, and I think, oh, my, I must be dying, I'm sort of going, that's probably a horse, if that makes sense. And it does, yeah, it does help me. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's how I've always been is this alarmist. And I talked about a, a year ago, or maybe it was two years ago now, I, got, I had a sore throat and I, my, I went to an ENT and he diagnosed me with um, silent reflux or LPR, whatever you 
call it. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have no voice. I'm going to have esophageal cancer. And, and now I've realized a year later, after a year of that, I realized, oh, I just, my throat's sore for a few hours after I eat pizza. <laughs> it's, it's fine. But anyway, so I owe all of this to the combination of uh, meditation and therapy is what I'm getting at here. But um, I And I started practicing Buddhism and pretty seriously, I went on some long retreats before I got sober. And when I got sober, I kept meditating and I kind of get back into it after sort of fading, drifting from it somewhat. I got sort of back into it, but I was so busy like rebuilding my life in all the practical ways. You know, I, again, I kind of had thought like meditation will fix my life, but and I neglected all the things that I, that practical things. So, you know, I got sober and I went back to school and, and uh, things started to really change uh, in terms of uh, the externals for sure, as well as the internals. And then at like six, seven years sober, I started to get really seriously back into meditation. And, and now I had more of a, you know, healthy psychological framework to build on or, uh, um, and and so my meditation practice really deepened and um you know i live in berkeley uh there were two teachers here who had regular classes and i became close with both of them and sat with them a lot and was going on 10-day retreats every year sometimes two-week retreats and so at about 12 years sober this one year a lot happened like i got engaged and i got invited into a teacher training program oh. because there was sort of a at that point most of the buddhist teachers were, were like teaching retreats like longer retreats but there was an increasing sort of need for people to teach more just sort of drop in classes and like a day long and things and, and and some of the senior teachers realized, oh, there's a lot of people around like me. I mean, I've been practicing for 15, 17 years. You know, a lot of people around who have the background to be teachers, but they're not going to commit to teaching month long retreats or something, you know. Mm -hmm. So let's train them. And so the Spirit Rock Meditation Center, where I'm, where I was trained and where I, I now I'm a regular, have a monthly class there, um, they started a program. To, to and they invited me into it called Community Dharma Leaders, and we had a two-year teacher training program. And and during that time, you know, I I started to teach regularly, and and pretty quickly I realized that there was this subset of the Buddhist community who were sober or were in recovery, and and so I started to offer offer things for them. Especially, especially, yeah. And this is Spirit Rock is that Jack Cornfield? Or yes, that's yes. Right? Jack Jack is the founder, or one of the co-founders there. Yeah, yeah. He's he's wonderful. He's one of the guys that I found uh, early when I started sort of discovering uh, meditation. And there was a time in my life where I was really right before I got married, I was dealing with all this panic attacks that I hadn't had in a long time, and it was a really hard time and i went to this bookstore and mm -hmm. um so the wise heart his book the wise yeah. heart and it was like an old used hardcover copy mm. and it was like a savior it was amazing and um he's a terrific teacher you know he has a great i mean he has a very deep understanding of buddhism he's also interested in a wide variety of kind of mystical traditions but he's also a, a phd psychologist and, uh, you know, he, he's able to really get at, he's able to, able to really connect that deep Buddhist psychology with contemporary Western emotional stuff and our, our 
human our humanness you know take it down off the mountaintop and uh, his 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 book a path with heart which which is from about 92 or 93 is is kind of similar to a wise heart you know a lot of stories it's more uh, whereas a wise heart is like uh, specifically a, like he says buddhist psychology a path with heart is called a guide i think a guide to the promises and perils of the spiritual path and that really helped me i i've seen a lot of people in recovery it, it helped me in my recovery um i think for similar reasons that you're describing it really gets to stuff that's very meaningful and very practical at the same time yeah, it's amazing that all these things sort of work um, in concert, which is one of those terms that I've heard people use, so I use. Uh, yeah. But yeah. Um, it is um, it is amazing how much. And to me, all of the things that really help me all come back to acceptance. I, I mean, sobriety, yeah. twelve the twelve step program, and and Buddhism and meditation and therapy. I still go to therapy every week for years, mm -hmm. and so many of these things come back to um, acceptance. It's, it's so much of suffering is just resisting something that that is. Yeah. And um, it's frustrating because so many of these things are counterintuitive. Like uh, yeah. when I, I was someone that had a lot of panic attacks, it was so hard. I would get so like livid with my therapist who would say, you have to accept it. You're, you're fighting yeah. it. It doesn't work to fight it. And it makes me, it would make me crazy. And then all of a sudden, like so many things, sobriety is like this for me, is there is like this moment of clarity where you're like, oh, I see. And to just experience it and go, oh, here's my anxiety, my stomach's dead. And to kind of sit and just experience um, these appearances in consciousness of, oh, my stomach feels a little funny. My heart's beating faster than it normally would. Or my, I feel a little dizzy. And to realize that all of these things are just sort of experiences in consciousness and you're not going to die from anxiety or panic attack. And yeah. it's, it's amazing how, but I guess, I don't even know if I have a question. I'll just, I'll just stop talking and volley it to you, but the acceptance is this through line through all of these um, things. Yeah, absolutely. It is. And I think, <sighs> It needs support, you know, it needs support. It needs, um, it needs the support of compassion and it needs the support of mindfulness and it needs the support of wisdom. <laughs> uh, the, it, so what I mean by that is that when you're going through a panic attack, it really helps when you can have this attitude of compassion towards yourself, like, oh, this is really difficult. And this would be hard for anybody, not just me kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And mindfulness, which is accepting it means that I'm actually going to have to feel it. And that's, that takes some practice to, to feel, to learn how to feel. So you need that clarity. And then the wisdom one of the key, well, there's two wisdom factors, particularly. One is the, re, the reminder of impermanence. Oh, this is going to pass. So that's one of the things that makes it possible to accept it. Because if, if you think this is going to last forever, which is how it feels, mm -hmm. it's going to be really hard to accept. You're going to think like, no, no, I can't live with this forever. Right. But remembering, oh, it's impermanent. Okay, that helps. And what you were talking about before, which is, it's not me. And, and one of the things that I like to point to, and this is a mindfulness kind of perspective as well, is experiencing anxiety and depression as energetic states rather than as psychological states. They, because they are, you know, right. I mean, they're both, but the, when you when you bring mindfulness to the energetic level, it takes you out of the mental, you know, argument or struggle and takes you just onto this visceral experience 
of, oh, wow, that's, that's intense. And, and we know like, you know, the, I mean, the, the line between anxiety and elation is bl very blurry. You know, right. put somebody, put somebody on a roller coaster, you know, wow. You know, they're sort of in a panic state, but they're, they're enjoying it, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I, I don't know. I mean, depression too can be felt as an energy as like, Oh, this is just this heavy energy in my body. And, and of course, one of the antidotes to both of them is to, to respond physically. And it happens that the antidote to both of them is activity, right? right? When you, when you're active with, when there's anxiety, that's a way of burning it off or you know, kind of dissipating it. And when you're active with depression, it's a way of bringing the energy that you need. So uh, I just find that, you know, it takes it out of this realm of like, oh, I have a problem. Oh God, like I'm anxious, you know, what's wrong with me? Why am I anxious? What do I have to change in the world uh, or in my life to fix that so that I won't? It's like, there's always something to be afraid of. I mean, you're going to die. We should be walking around in fear all the time. We don't know <laughs> when we're going to die. Shit. I mean, damn, that's really a problem. <laughs> it is, but it, it's interesting because, you know, that's the thing with uh, impermanence is it, it works for the, this too shall pass works with the good and the bad, you know, yeah. it's, um, it, it's an interesting way. And it, it, it talks about that in, um, you know, the 12 steps of, we shouldn't get too excited either. Excitement can be bad, you know? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I drank when I was happy because uh, let's have fun. <laughs> and I would drink when I was not happy because it was like, I need to cheer up. So <laughs> it's just, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's so interesting. And, and, you know, what that's pointing to in Buddhist terms is that we want to let go of all of it. Right. You know, don't be attached to the good or the bad. Just see it all as just this is just what's happening. It's coming, it's going. No reason to hold on to it. Enjoy it if it's pleasant, you know. Don't fight it if it's unpleasant, and it's not gonna become a problem. Mindful Metal Jacket is hosted by comedian Joe List, produced by Joe List. Edited by Matt Kleinschmidt. Executive producers Robert Kelly and Matt Kleinschmidt for the Laugh Button Podcasts. <laughs>